Hi, so my name is Tara, and about um, 10 years ago, um, I started um, growing flowers on a half acre piece of land in um, Silver Lake. Um, back then, when people asked me, what do you do for a living? I felt really uncomfortable because I didn't do anything. I felt silly because I was just growing flowers, right? I just felt silly. So, so I said, well, I call myself an urban farmer. And, um, and I, I call my business <laughs> Silver Lake Farms. Um, so um, um, since then, I've, I've sort of um, come to understand that urban farming means different things to different people. Um, it's gardening at, at home when you take a, a piece of your garden and, and convert it over to the food production. Um, also, I'm gardening in a community garden plot, measuring 15 by 15. Um, that man's pointing. Stand <laughs> at the podium. Uh, sorry. <laughs> 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 oh, he's pointing at me. <laughs> um, so, um, it's, what, where was I? It's gardening, it's, it's also farming. It's uh, farming on uh, residential land like I do, but for um, it's small scale and it's commercial. You take your harvest to the local farmer's market. It's actually uh, a new farmer's market in Altadena that is... Um, giving some space to start up urban farms. Um, a farming also can be in city land, again, um, by non-profit organizations um, that um, harness a, volunteer, um, a lot of volunteers and um, they get uh, grants. And um, they, I think the most successful um, non-profit urban farm is probably Growing Power in Wisconsin. Um, but I think that in the 21st century, uh, food production just clearly seems to be moving closer and closer to home, where you have more vegetable gardens, more community gardens, and more, earth, uh, more farmers markets popping up. Um, but the thing is, how do you know that it's actually working? Um, what does it look like when it's working? And, and is it supposed to be this big, big thing that solves a lot of our really critical problems like poverty and uh, obesity and um, isolation, alienation, you know, just sort of dysfunction, society dysfunctions. Um, so how do you know when urban farming is solving anything? Does success look like this? Because, you know, I've, like I said, I've been doing this for about 10 years, and I can tell you, it really doesn't look like that. <laughs> I, still, I still don't have, like, a cash flow forecast or a business plan or any fancy bells and whistles. I don't have an advertising budget. So I'm, I'm close, I think, but I've had a few hurdles thrown my way, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, but to me, I, I can tell you that when I really feel like it's working and it's successful, it doesn't look anything like that. In fact, that has got very little to do with that feeling of, wow, this is working. Success looks more like that, in my mind, <laughs> which is three grown adults, me wearing my pajamas, um, hugging my compost pile. <laughs> <laughs> um, underneath that black, that's black, this green, it's a thick grade plastic, and we use that to keep the moisture in, because moisture is a critical component for making compost cook. And so this is Rachel and Bruce. Now, Rachel and Bruce are very interesting young people. They are the urban planners of the future, um, both architects and landscape architecture, uh, studying at USC, and I think Bruce is actually a, an employed architect. Um, they love compost. Why do we love compost so much? Well, just as it's, for me, it's critical because I cannot, um, I cannot grow, I cannot maintain and manage a healthy garden without compost. I can't grow beautiful things or, or like flowers or, or anything that tastes good uh, or any healthy, healthy plants. I cannot manage a healthy garden without compost. And, and just as I rely on compost, Bruce and Rachel, well, they can't plan a city or, or a community or even a world without thinking about waste and what to do with it and where it's all going and how to recycle it and reuse it and repurpose it and use it to either provide sustenance or feed back in some other way. So um, compost. I, underneath that, um, underneath that, this screen, that, that compost pile is actually created thanks to members of our community in Silver Lake. Um, I operate a, um, a small uh, CSA, Community Supported Agriculture Program, and thanks to um, the, the, the pastor at the local church, the community church, um, Randy Lovejoy, he says, 
yeah, come and, and, and do your CSA at the church. And, um, and so our shareholders, we have about 150, um, they bring us their kitchen scraps. And, um, and so what they do is, because it can get pretty pommy, right? So they, they keep, I, I urge them to keep their kitchen scraps in the freezer. And so every Friday they bring us their scraps and then, because I'm a good neighbor, believe it or not, you're here to the country, but I am a good neighbor. Um, I, I, uh, I take those kitchen scraps and I turn them, for what, not me anymore, but, but I used to, but now, now Adam does it. Um, so they turn, we turn all of these scraps into our compost pile every Monday. It's a four hour job, but it is critical to what I do. And I, I like to say that I produce more compost than I do anything and that we really can't be a, the kind of farm I want to be, or the kind of urban farm I want to be, we can't be one without it. Um, so the other thing that makes me feel like urban farming is, is working is when I see this. Now, these are our dahlias, they're capillae dahlias, and they're absolute beautiful perfection. And um, we, we sell, these flowers at, at only two farmers markets, um, one on Sunday, which is the Hollywood farmers market, and one on Thursday, which is the Sunset Strip market. And and the customers just, I, I some, what, somebody once told me that there are fairies about your flowers, <laughs> and and I, I like that's the best description I can think of. There's something in them, and I like to think it's the compost because all these people come by and they're like taking pictures and tweeting and Instagramming and Facebooking and blogging and emailing pictures of these, these flowers to everybody that they know and some. And I think to myself, wow, urban farming is working and it's successful because it's sending out this message via all these Instagram, Facebook, blah, blah messages. And, and the message is, look at, how, look at how real I am. And that's what compost does. And, and man, this is a much better alternative to all of those flowers which make up the majority of the flowers in our, in our stores today and florist shops today, especially in LA, that are actually imported. And they're imported and they're grown um, abroad, mostly in Andean countries, covered in pesticides and, and using tons of um, chemical fertilizers to the extent that um, uh, floral designers wear gloves because they don't want mercury poisoning. And so uh, people are going gaga with my flowers. Well, I was not expecting this at all. And, and sometimes I'm like, what it? What is going on? Uh, is the farmer's market managers like paying people to come and, and like check this out and take pictures? Like, are this is for real? Because I, 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 but, <laughs> but so it is. Um, <laughs> so uh, the other thing too that I know that urban farming is working is people like this. So this is, um, Andrew, Andrew Avery and Laura Gabbard and their daughters, uh, Jane and Ingrid, and their pal Stacey. Now, Andrew and Laura, uh, they have a big piece of land in Glasshall Park, and they just <coughs> called me out one day and said, hey, you want to farm here? You can grow here. Come on. We're going to share our land with you. And so I did. And, and like that's amazing. Like, urban farming is, is providing this opportunity for people to share their land. And then in return, um, people in, in our community on the east side of those two farmers markets, they get to enjoy hyper-local, like totally local, pesticide-free flowers, because I don't use anything except for compost and compost tea. We grow just using biology, really, and, um, and just like, you know, muscle. And, um, and so um, that's what they're, Via, via their land and via my principle as a farmer and my approach as a farmer, um, our community gets to enjoy these flowers that I sell at their price. Now, <laughs> um, this is what this is like the classic shot of an urban farm. I love this picture. This is this is the, our growing grounds in Glassell Park, and um, so we have the half acre silver lake, and you know, this is about ten thousand square feet, with downtown in the distance there. So it's a classic urban farm shot, I think. And um, there's a funny story about this growing ground because when, when I first got it, the, I think the house was built and they staged all the materials and all the, the machinery on that flat bit there because the, the soil was so compacted. I rented a tractor tiller and a friend of mine drove it and, um, and the, the tiller wouldn't bite down but two inches. And so me not knowing and having a 
clue because I did not, you know, I wasn't raised in a farming family. I, I had gone back to school um, in, the, in the, like 2002 after a 10 year career in PR and marketing, like a best job. And, um, and I had gone back to school to study botany and horticulture because I really wanted to do this. And so anyway, I'd never used a piece of machinery or anything like that. And so we rented this, this tractor tiller and then if that didn't work, it would bite down because the soil was so compacted. And so I was like, okay, get out the pickaxes. We're gonna pickaxe this baby. And and I, you know, we started off and within an hour I was like, oh my god, we can't do this. <laughs> so so then luckily this this fella appeared out of nowhere to volunteer uh, from Vermont, and he his name was Graham, and he said, um, well, I can I'll do I'll get a backhoe, rent a backhoe. So we rented a backhoe. And, and he, he dug those beds out, basically, and it was only after that he said to me, I don't have any experience. The closest experience he'd had was playing Nintendo as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> but, he, but he managed to work in 75 tons of compost, which a gentleman by the name of Eric Wilhite had donated to me and um, from Community Recycling. And so that 75 tons of compost was worked in, and, and I sowed my first crop. But then disaster struck because you know all, all so far all you've heard is like these wonderful stories of people donating their land and, and people bringing me their scraps and we turn them into compost and we create beautiful flowers and we grow amazing things. But then this happened. I got shut down, um, and it was it was a, it's crazy nonsense really. Um, and what it is, I think, is that um, the spirit was there from people, from the human factor, but the law had, wasn't quite there. It was, it was too old and, it, and, it, and uh, not clear enough. And, and then I got shut down um, the compost as well, and which you have to read this. It says, in 2007, we started producing double the amount of rich, beautiful compost using raw organic kitchen scraps from Hanaway Restaurant in Atwater Village. Thank you, Chef Karina Vardell, la 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 for their loving dedication to sorting and recycling. You're the best, my class thinks so too. What a sweet message, bang, no, you can't do this. It's illegal. And so um, we had to basically, I had to stop what I was doing and like <coughs> figure out what I was gonna do next. And that was, we formed an organization called Urban Farming Advocates and um, led by, this is Shelley Marks. Uh, you might know him, that's Eric Nixon. And, um, and that's a supermodel, curse to you. And um, so, so uh, Shelley, <laughs> Shelley Marks, um, she knew how to navigate City Hall. And so um, we formed this group. And it took about a year. And, um, and we got the law clarified so that um, anybody in a residential zone can now grow vegetables and fruit and flowers and nuts and fiber and sell them off-site at local farmers markets, for example. So thus, urban farming um, Now, that was the city of LA. Now, get this, oh, and by the way, after that law was passed, very recently, um, the city went one step further and said, we're gonna make it le legal for, uh, for farmers markets to exist in residential zones. So um, there's going to be a lot of competition for you for that. Very <laughs> much. <laughs> uh, no, I doubt it very much because these will be very small, uh, singular affairs. Um, but farmers markets are now legal in um, in uh, residential zones. Um, so that so now that's the city. But here we have Mark Stambler who bakes bread in his backyard. And um, he, supply, he, he was supplying a couple of restaurants. It's one of the breads got three ingredients in it. Water, salt, and flour. And that's it. And, um, and he was supplying a couple of um, uh, retail uh, uh, outlets in, the, in our neighborhood and, and our CSA. But, and his bread is so good, and what he was doing was so unique, that the Los Angeles Times wrote this big full page article, and then the health department read it and went, bang, who can't do that, that's illegal. So, so now we are the only ones in the whole of LA that get his bread because we're a CSA and we kind of don't fall in that. Well, don't, just don't tell anyone. Where are CSAs, please? Oh, again. Anyway, so now what he's doing is, because this is a state law, so now, um, thanks to the, 
a bread bakers um, organization in Los Angeles. Uh, they have um, written a lot of legislation, and then Mike Gatto, Gatto um, a, a state assembly man, he introduced it very recently in Sacramento. And I went up there to show my support, and, um, and so did about 30 other people. It was hugely um, supported. And what this is is AB 1616, which still needs support, so please um, vote for it. Um, and um, what that is, is it's unique, it's uh, because we don't have one. The state of California does not have a cottage food law. Many, many states in America do, but California does not. And so AB 1616 is a homemade food act. And what that will allow is bread bakers and jam jammers and <laughs> jam, um, preservers and picklers. Um, it will allow them to make um, these things at home and sell them on a retail level. And so what that will do for somebody like me as an urban farmer is when I grow my tomatoes, I can actually make them into um, you know, sauces and stuff or, or uh, dry them or whatever, and I'll be able to sell that on my stand at, at market is my understanding. And so, so that's what's happening on, on the state level. So then, um, yeah, everything, everything hyper-local and super connected. And, um, and so what, just to summarize now, what you have is like a world in Los Angeles where you have food grown super locally, bread baked super locally, and farmers markets in residential zones made legal. So you can imagine how that might look in your community, designed by Rachel and Bruce, where waste is, you know, at the center of it and how we deal with it. So you, you can imagine, you know, there's um, Don selling his bread to his neighbor who lives up the street, who buys flowers from Tara, where her compost comes from Joe and Adam and Andy. You know, so we're building community here. So this is what urban farming is looking like. Community building on a really hyper-local level, and food production moving really close to home, and, um, and those food systems existing much, much closer to home, which is actually a lot more sustainable. Um, during the time that we, that we were shut down, I just had to keep moving, um, and so that was when I started the CSA, and I just had to put up this picture, because like, don't you want to be ladies? Don't you want to be in the CSA? <laughs> supporting a farm that would be us um, rather than a third party distributor that is not in our farming um, and we also support um, local farms uh, that are in LA and neighboring counties so local is the key word local meaning close to home not you know uh, north of, north of uh, San Francisco or anywhere near San Francisco it means really close to home and um, and so we also support our local ranches and um, this is um, Lefty. Um, we, we got a, a pick from Lefty, and uh, I probably broke the rule again, but it's too late, the feds can't get me because it's done, right? <laughs> so, um, so uh, I, but I just want to read out that little portion uh, where it says, you know, it's people like you that make it possible for us to keep raising our animals the way we believe they should be raised. And by God, is that the truth? Um, I, I always go to all the farms uh, that supply our CSA because I want to know for sure that they're growing what they say they're growing in the way that I that meets my standards because I'm very picky. Um, and so um, this is this is a this is our pig. Now um, the crazy thing about this pig was that the, the rancher is at about 70 miles from Silver Lake, but he had to travel 300 miles to Modesto and 300 miles back to the slaughterhouse, because there's no slaughterhouses around here, because there's no ranches really around here. And so that was not sustainable. And I was like, Lefty, I don't want you to drive 300 miles there and 300 miles back. That makes no sense. We'll get our own slaughterer. And um, I found a slaughterhouse. I probably broke the law again. Um, and then I probably broke the law again when I picked up the carcass and drove it in the back of the van oh. to the butchers. But, you know, <laughs> 
the butchers stuck the thermometer in like, oh my, you've got to get to work. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody, yeah, everybody's healthy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I did do one second thing. We did a little different thing. We actually, and I'm sorry, I do apologize to vegetarians and animal lovers, uh, animal rights activists, but, you know, we eat meat, and, and I, I, the only meat I eat is when I can sh look the man in the eye or the woman in the eye and grew it. Otherwise, I, I don't eat meat. I only eat the meat where I know where it's been, and I, and I, I shook everyone's hand and bowled it into um, And um, it made me think very differently about eating meat. It really did. Um, especially as the slaughterhouse that we found, I'm so glad that I would never get their pig because those pigs were not happy at all. These pigs were happy and um, nearly right to the very, very end. The second pig, we actually found a mobile slaughterer, so the pig was happy right to the very end. But I'll move on because I don't want to so, 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 um, <laughs> So then, um, this is another local farmer that we um, that we support, and um, him and his wife live in Ontario, um, California, uh, right on the border with Chino. And this, I wanted to show you this picture because this is if you read Omnivore's Dilemma and about Joel Saladin in, um, in Virginia. Um, this is this guy is like a huge fan, Dave, and um, and so you know this is the the way that he raises his chickens. They're all pasture raised, and then he'll move the cage around. The, the, actually, they lift it and move it, and um, and so we support them as well. Um, so, um, in summary, um, <laughs> what does urban farming look like when it's working? Because the title of this this of this my presentation was supposed to be urban farming: how to make it work. And I was like, oh my god, why did I call it that? Because I don't really know what the answer is. Um, but I think that um, the answer is that this is how you make urban farming work. You grow a little bit of your own, because that makes you an urban farmer, and you um, get a community, or you grow in a community garden plot for you and your family, um, or you uh, join a CSA, or you shop at your local farmer's markets. And that's really, to me, what urban farming is, because it's all about local production. Um, and the goodness of it is, is that you feed back, you link people, you connect people, um, you share land and space and good vibes and everybody is working really, really hard. Like it's the hardest job I've ever, ever done. And I'm still not making any money. It's like, it's ridiculous. But I'm addicted. Like I keep, keep going. And I end up um, being inspired by um, people like Adam Rust, who, um, this is the new face of urban farming. He's my right-hand man. He's 26 years old. And um, he has taken us into microgreens and mushrooms. And he came straight from Wisconsin to come and work with me. Um, he came from Growing Power, which, if you remember, I um, touched on earlier before, is probably the most successful not for profit urban farm in the country. And, and that's where Adam comes from. And then this last slide is just sent to me the other day by my friend Tiffany. She goes, Someone's walking again down Sunset. <laughs> 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 ha, 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 ha.